please welcome Martin Melbourne. I'm not a musician, by the way. I was once a very, very bad drummer with a very bad punk band for about seven shows. Yeah. What was sort of the light bulb moment for you that made you realise you wanted to be involved behind the scenes? Um, probably when I was about 16. Um, I was quite lucky where I lived in that uh, the, uh, the Rainbow Theatre in Finsbury Park in London, which was by far and away the most important live music venue in London those days, was actually a very easy train ride and my parents didn't mind me going up with our mates to see lots of bats. I pretty much saw every band there, apart from Bob Marley, unfortunately. Oh. And it was around about the time he did that live record. But also I lived about... And my, I could walk to Nibworth House. I actually had a job at Nibworth House, which is like a stately home in the UK. And in the um, early 70s, when Glastonbury was only just starting to get going and was tiny, the biggest outdoor shows in Europe were at Nibworth House. So, and I, because I worked at the weekend there, I got free tickets for it. So the, it was, um, the first two shows were two nights at Led Zeppelin, and then later on it was Pink Floyd, Rolling Stones, you know, major, Outrageous. Major. They used to have signs saying Progressive Music Festival this way. <laughs> so... So you're getting into music. So basically, I, ever since then, I haven't paid to get into a concert. <laughs> <laughs> I was a music fan from pretty early on. I mean, I'd say, you know... Um, these, and my, my high school was actually split between um, soul fans and prog rock fans. Mm. And embarrassing, I've got to say, I was in the prog rock department. Um, but um, although it was kind of weird that Genesis was my, actually my favourite band for quite a while, so to work with Peter Gabriel later on was kind of cool. But I got mm. the concept of punk really quickly. I see. Because yeah. that was when I was at university. I see. Yeah. You, it sounds like you're in the perfect place to actually see some of it unfold. I, I think I've actually had some incredibly lucky timings in my life. So obviously I was lucky living where I was living. So what made you take that step from being a very avid music fan that could sneak into all these gigs to becoming a promoter and actually putting on your own gigs? Not everyone has that kind of initiative. Well, it was really, well again, it was like good time because the university... We were using their money to put on the shows. Perfect. Which is pretty good training. But also we started, doing, we started getting involved because of the whole nature of the punk movement and the, and the years immediately afterwards. Um, you know, we got to know all the, lo all the local bands. Well, we did have full-time student union officials and we had a, an eight-storey building with four bars in it. And, um, That's an amazing ratio. Yeah, it wasn't good for my health, I have to say. <laughs> um, so we actually opened, and we had a thousand capacity room, which is actually the best room in Bristol. Mm. And so we opened it up to the public, which just as punk happened. So um, in, we, you, know, you, could, you could put on like three local bands there, and you'd sell out 700 tickets. So, and it was very easy to promote it. I mean, obviously this is way pre any internet stuff, so you just literally you're going around... A few posters on post, the post, Exactly, union. a few posters, flyer in the right gigs. And, uh, I mean, people just would, yeah, would go pretty much come and see everything we put on. Haven't times changed? Yeah, but it was a lot of people actually starting in the UK music industry started exactly that time. How did you hook up with Peter Gabriel? Because, um, we, well, so we did this, basically I couldn't get a job. And so, and the, and the basement of the student flat I had in was kind of available so there were a bunch of also unemployed local musicians. So there was my, basically we did this double fold gate. It was like vinyl record with a double fold sleeve and a magazine in the middle. Mm. And we got all the quirky people in Bristol to write for it. And we sold advertising on it. So that was kind of like, you know, so it was, it was never exactly a fantastic business model. But it, um, you know, it did break even. <laughs> and NME made it. Um, compilation album of the year in the first year we did it and it got rave reviews in New York and things like that and so it was, it was the first two were just purely local things and then Peter lived in Bath so he got in touch because he'd heard about it and said well I'll, you know, I'll give you, do an interview with you and I'll give you three tracks and that's at the time when Peter Gabriel was one of the biggest artists in the world so that was quite a major thing so suddenly we literally went worldwide mm. He then had the idea of WOMAD Festival and said, oh, I'm thinking of doing this festival of mixing up world music. It wasn't called, we didn't, we, we sort of invented the term world music. Um, so it wasn't called world music then, but he was getting more interested in African beats and things like that. So he wanted to do this festival mixing up that so with Western bands like Talking Heads and 
This was about 82? 82 was the first, because this year is, was our 30th anniversary. Oh, Bye. OK. Um, so um, for some reason, he thought it was a good idea entrusting this project to a bunch of semi-unemployed 21-year-olds. <laughs> and um, so we did it. We lost a then world record um, in terms of the money lost on one concert. Oh, no. So it was an absolute disaster. Financially, yeah. But artistically, it's, it's brought you here. People, people loved it, yeah. Because the other thing that Wayne Radio realised is it was also the first sort of boutique festival. Mm. Uh, I mean, at the time, there, were, there was only Cambridge Folk Festival, Reading Rock Festival, and Glastonbury, which was way smaller. Glastonbury was about 20,000 people. Mm. So we were the first ones to sort of in, incorporate an educational programme in it, really think about the food and drink we were putting on. So it set a lot of standards that are now industry norms. Your... Um part of an initiative to revitalise Adelaide. Um, I know this is part of a, a long uh, process over the next year and you'll be visiting Adelaide a, a few times over the coming year. What are your first impressions? It's actually been pretty lively. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I, and I also think it's got some of the, you know, some world-class venues here, which isn't really the problem. Um, so, and I think, I mean, personally, I, I mean, I've, you know, I think the negative bits around Adelaide are pretty obvious. You, know, you just walk down Hindley Street and Rundle Mall. That's the sort of centre of your, what I now call your central entertainment and cultural district. It's no longer the CBD. So that's not a great shop face of the world. But, I mean, having said that, the, the, hard, the difficult bit is actually being done. There are many, many, many cities in the world who would love to have that entertainment and cultural centre that Adelaide's got. You know, and I think what it hasn't had is obviously a successful, a really successful international band, because that always spurs things on. And, um, I th and, and, you know, the music industry is not a big industry here. It seems to be quite fractured. Mm. What will you be doing to help vitalise the town? Well, I guess that's what you're in the process of... I'm in of... the process of doing that, so there's a, there's a limit to what I can say on that because, you know, a lot of that is to do with licensing issues, which I still haven't completely got my head round, and we're actually, you know, we have been having very constructive meetings with the police and various other things. So I wouldn't want to prejudice that. And also, we're not there yet. Sure. Terms of the thing. I mean, you know, one, one obvious thing, but it's, you know, even that's not that easy to do, is just to create more gig opportunities for Adelaide bands because, you know, obviously it has a problem in that it. it's kind of like a city-state with nothing in between. So it's very hard for a band to, you know, you know that Michael Gladwell thing of doing 10,000 hours. Well, I mean, that's virtually impossible to do in Adelaide. Mm. Uh, I mean, I often give this example of a uh, UK young sort of rock dancer called N. Shikari who basically doing extremely well. I mean, they're, you know, they're 21 years old and they've already done 2,000, 3,000 shows. But then they live like 10 miles north of London and their two dads are both effectively retired and drive the band round and are their crew. So they had this incredibly efficient thing. I mean, now they've got to the stage where they're doing 6,000 tickets in London and they're doing American tours and you know, could almost certainly tour over here. But I mean, in other words, they built up their act just doing those shows and shows and shows. And they don't really have that great songs, but they are a fantastic live band. And that's because... And they've got cheap roadies. They, and they've got cheap roadies, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't rip them up. Yeah, yeah. Their managers are really yeah. You talk to bands who say, oh, we were told not to come to Adelaide, but we're here and we love it. It's a great city. We didn't know it was like this. Where is that negativity coming from and why, doesn't, why aren't bands being booked here? I mean, you know, it definitely in the last couple of years it's gotten a lot better in, with bigger acts, bigger shows, things like that. But where is that negativity coming from? It's difficult. I mean, I mean, some of that is coming from industry professionals. So if you speak to a national promoter, you know, they have a problem with Adelaide because it's the hardest place for them to sell tickets in, and it's the slowest place, place for them to sell tickets in. I, th I think a lot of it is that sort of centre is a bit sort of dead and a bit dated and a bit dull but actually there are a lot of things happening here um, you know maybe even part of it's the fact that it's so easy to get away at the weekends which you wouldn't do I, don't know, so, I mean a different and, and there is no role model isn't there I mean it does help when um, you have successful bands they inspire other bands I mean I, I said I did a great escape in Brighton which is not a huge city it's 250,000 people and we've probably got about 20 artists that are full-time professionals touring the world. You know, one was called Nick Cave. I suppose he's not technically a Brian resident, but you know, it just has that. Now, okay, it's near London, 
But, uh, you know, it has a music school, it has loads of venues, it's never lost that thing. So clearly Adelaide has kind of, you know, lost that stuff now. You know, that's, that's kind of hard to sort of define when or where that didn't happen. Um, you know, there's obviously, it's, it's, it's the, you know, you've got far fewer shows happening in the suburbs. <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously the pokey situation doesn't help. I think the whole licensing situation, I mean, it's, it's very hard to just even organise a gig. So it's very hard to build up an audience and get people going again, you know. I mean, I wouldn't want to come in and see a band in Central Adelaide if, unless they were going on stage at, like, 10 at night. You know, they had that, they had that report this morning that, uh, you know, people are drinking quite large amounts of money before going out at night. You know, it would obviously be much better if they were watching bands from 7 to but that's, you know, that's going to take time to change. I, actually, I think you've got more than enough venues here. I think, actually, the problem is local talent and re, re-energising an, an audience to go, go and see it. I mean, you, you've probably got more venues in, in that central area of Adelaide than any other city in the southern hemisphere. You know, that is, frankly, you could do with a couple more closing down. Uh, I do think, you know, the, lic- the whole licensing and building regulations thing and how they're implemented, that is obviously an issue because it's, um, it's putting a lot of costs on small venues. I mean, it is very hard to run a 200-capacity live venue if you don't have pokies, you know, whatever, to actually make money on that. So it's tough. So putting all these administrative barriers on it is obviously not is not good. I mean, in the UK now, if you're below 200 capacity and your show finishes at 11, you do not need an entertainment licence. Uh, you talked about Iceland having a very small population, but it was still producing great bands. What are they doing differently to what we're doing? There's one thing that nearly all the Nordic countries, by Nordic I mean Iceland, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and increasingly the Baltic countries as well, is they have are probably the best music education in their schools. So it's quite rare for someone to leave high school in those countries not being able to sing, play an instrument. It's fascinating. Yeah. And that's why they got... That's one of the reasons why. Why Iceland has this particular concentration... I mean, they are... I mean, I don't know if, Have you ever met any Iceland people? I mean, they're really interesting. So they are... They, I mean, they enjoy being different and quirky. And they celebrate it. And it's celebrated in their, in their, in their culture... I mean, Estonia is starting to t- take off now as like a different place. Not, they haven't had any of like, the success of Iceland yet, but I think they will do because of the nature of Tallinn. And, I mean, I go to an event there, the Estonia, Tallinn Music Week, that's the capital of Estonia. I mean, twice running, the president of Estonia has come and opened the conference, and he normally gives a half-hour lecture about the lyrics of PJ Harvey or something about Arcade Fire or things like that, you know. And it's just sort of, I think yeah. I'm moving there. That oh, sounds great. amazing. Oh, it's, a, it's a great place, yeah. It has Wi-Fi. The whole country has free Wi-Fi. Can you please join me in thanking firstly Henry Waggins and then Martin Elbon for their wonderful presentation. It has been a very... I've found it a really positive process. The great thing about it is it does open doors. Mm. So you can actually sort of... And people have seen... So far, people are treating the sort of process with, with respect. So, you know, so hopefully something good will will come out of it. So I I do find it intellectually interesting.